Sometimes life can be straightforward. Sometimes life can be difficult. It can be a piece of cake. And it can be full of turmoil. Sometimes life is smooth sailing. But sometimes it's messy and feels out of control. James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God. Draw near to him and he will draw near to you. James teaches how to live through trials and how to live with faith. It's the New Testament Book of Wisdom. Well, hey, everybody, welcome to church. I'm so glad that you're here today. I'm happy to be with you. And I want to say a special welcome to our church family in Prophetstown and those of you joining us online. I love you, and I'm so glad that we get to be together today. If you have your Bible, you can go ahead and turn to James chapter 2. We have finally made it to the second chapter in the book of James. And you know, one of the reasons I love the book of James so much is because it's very clear and it's also so applicable. Like it doesn't matter what you're going through in your life, what season or stage of life you're in. James is one of those books that you can pick up, read, and you can just receive the wisdom and immediately apply it to wherever you're at. James, he actually wrote this book as a letter to Christians. And he wrote it with the purpose of encouraging them and correcting them and helping them. And, you know, I'm just going to be honest and say, even though we're like only four weeks into this series, there have already been a few moments with me and Jesus where uh, I have felt convicted and called out and challenged. And like, let me just tell you, that's a good thing. It doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus. Some of you have known him longer than I've been alive. But stay attentive to his speaking. The word of God is powerful. Yes? And the Holy Spirit uses scripture to call out the things in us that do not belong and to convict us of sin. And when he does, we have an opportunity to be offended and dismissive. Right? Right? But we also have an opportunity to be humble, to repent, and to change. And so just to, like, be honest, my prayer that I've been praying for you all week is the same prayer that I'm praying for myself. And that's, God, would you keep me humble before you? God, would you teach me by the power of your word? Would you, would you help me to be a good listener? Would you help me, God, to be willing to make changes, to be more like you? Amen? We should pray these things. Now I have a question for you. How many of you have ever been judged? Yeah? Okay, a lot of you. We've pretty much all been judged, right? And we don't like it. Nobody likes to be judged. I've never met anybody who says they enjoy being thought of a less than or they like being picked apart or assigned a certain category. We don't like that. I was homeschooled K through 12, and I still remember my first year of college, I was sitting next to this guy talking to him in one of my classes, and it was brought up that I'd been homeschooled. And he very quickly and confidently says, oh, so statistically, you're smarter than me, but you didn't have any friends. Like, really? Really? You got all of that just by knowing that I was homeschooled? And I would like to tell you that that didn't bother me so much, and I just let it roll off my back. But that was 13 years ago, and I, I'm bringing it up today. And I'm also still pretty certain that my judgments of that guy were way more accurate. And I think that actually he was way smarter than me, but I bet I had a lot more friends. Now, we don't like to be judged, do we? But how easy is it for us to judge other people? We don't like it. It's not even a 
conscious decision most of the time. Sometimes it just comes out of us. Something that we do not like to receive, we so freely give. Now, how about this? How many of you have ever been the favorite of anything? Favorite teacher, favorite student, favorite athlete. Okay, okay, we have some favorites. You guys like to be the favorite, yeah? I think my dad is here today, and uh, he can tell you who his favorite kid is. It's my brother, okay? (laughs) Pastor Jeremiah Randleman, everybody. Dad can attest, all right? Maybe uh, Maybe you're not the favorite. Maybe you didn't get picked for dodgeball, and you hated recess, and maybe for some of you, this is painful because you have spent a lot of your life feeling judged and overlooked and dismissed. And you know that that is a terrible feeling. But today in our text, James, he gives us a very clear instructions on the topic of favoritism and judgment. And I believe that God is going to speak to us through the power of his word. So we're going to look at James, and then we're also going to look at Jesus' thoughts on the same topic. So James chapter 2, starting in verse 1, he writes, My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? For example... Suppose someone comes into your meeting dressed in fancy clothes and expensive jewelry, and another comes in who is poor and dressed in dirty clothes. If you give special attention and a good seat to the rich person, but you say to the poor person, you can, you can sit over there or else have a seat on the floor. Well, doesn't your discrimination show that your judgments are guided by evil motives? And if you have your Bible, why don't you go ahead and underline or highlight that line that says your judgments are guided by evil motives. I think that's important for us to hear and understand. James goes on in verse 5, and he says, Listen to me, dear brothers and sisters. Hasn't God chosen the poor in this world to be rich in faith? Aren't they the ones who will inherit the kingdom he promised to those who love him? But you dishonor the poor. And isn't it the rich who oppress you and drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who slander Jesus Christ, whose noble name you bear? He says, yes, indeed, it's good when you obey the royal law. The royal law would be what we call the golden rule or the law of love. James says it's good for you to obey the royal law, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you favor some people over others, you're committing a sin. You're guilty of breaking the law. For the person who keeps all of the law except one is as guilty as a person who's broken all of God's laws. For the same God, this is how he finishes, verse 11. He says, for the same God who said you must not commit adultery also said you must not murder. So if you murder someone but you do not commit adultery, you've still broken the law. And James, he doesn't really leave a lot of room for guesswork here. It's kind of painfully clear. Judgments are guided by evil motives. They're breaking God's law. This is not God's plan and purpose for his children. And the thing about judgment and favoritism is that it always causes pain. And oftentimes, we really only think about the pain it causes on the person that we are judging. We think about the pain that's being inflicted on the one that we're judging or overlooking or dismissing. I think we can all pretty much uh, understand why we shouldn't judge people because it's not fair and it hurts them, right? Those things are valid and true, but today I want us to focus more on what it does to us. I want us to look inward and see how our judgments and favoritism affect our own hearts, Because I'm convinced that it causes so much unnecessary pain inside of us. And something I just want to clarify before we go any further is that facts and judgments are not the same thing. And they're not interchangeable. 
facts are based on the truth of a situation. Something that was said, something that was done, okay? And judgments, those are based on our feelings and our thoughts and the conclusions that we come to as a result of something that was said or done. I've heard it said that judgment is when you assume to know why someone did what they did or said what they said. Like, Let's just say that you are driving along in your car like this and uh, you're minding your own business and you're having a good day and you're coming up to a red light when all of a sudden somebody comes flying from behind you and they run the red light, right? We've probably had something similar like this happen. Now what you observed is someone speeding. You observed someone running the red light. The, The fact is that they even broke a traffic law. But now judgment comes into play when you begin to entertain why they ran the red light and why they were speeding. Oh, he's just a reckless driver. Oh, he wasn't paying any attention. They're probably on a runaway. Or if you're over the age of 40, my favorite, it had to be a teenager on their cell phone. But really, you don't know any of that. You have no idea what was happening in that car. For all you know, some poor guy could have had his wife who just gave birth to their baby in the backseat of that car, and he's trying to get him to a hospital, and he doesn't need your judgment, okay? Now, that's kind of a lighthearted example, but the truth is that we do this with more serious things, too. A coworker leaves the company, and you begin to think that you know that it's probably because he was kind of a flake anyways, Or she always kind of seemed like the person that didn't value other people's time. She was late to everything. Or he seemed like the kind of guy that probably stole money. Those are judgments. Those are harsh judgments. Maybe you know a couple who's struggling and they're going through a divorce. And all of a sudden, maybe even just in your mind, you've made yourself the expert on their marriage. Oh, I always thought he was kind of this way. I bet he was this and that to her. And I think she's this. Oh, she would, I, I, if I wouldn't marry to her, I would. And you judge. You heap judgments on these people. And you know what? What we could do in situations of pain or stress is we could pray for people. We could have a heart of compassion towards people. Shoot, we could mind our own business and stay out of it a lot of times too. But when you get into judgment, you just heap pain onto pain. Pain onto the person, the situation, and pain onto yourself. Well, Susie and I, we used to talk every single week. But I called her last week and she didn't answer. And so she probably doesn't want to be my friend anymore. And she's probably mad about me, about something I said. And let me tell you, friend, that's not just hurting Susie. You're hurting yourself Judgments never just hurt the person that you're judging. It hurts you. It harms you. It allows bitterness and anger and resentment to grow inside of you. And before you know it, you are weary and heavy burdened over a storyline that you made up. We have to separate facts from a perceived motive. We have to do this even if it takes a lot of work, even if it takes a ton of intentionality because you came from a long line of judges. Maybe judging is just part of how you grew up and it's always been in your family and it's always been what you've heard and what you've known and it's become such normal behavior. But now that you know the truth, you can change by the power of God at work inside of you. I want us to look at what Jesus has to say about judgment. This is Matthew chapter 7 in verse 1. Jesus says, do not judge others. Thank you, Jesus. All right, there you have it. Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. Jesus is basically giving this warning that generally the way you treat and judge others is how you'll be treated and judged yourself. And then in verse 3, Jesus says, 
And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, here, let me help you get that speck out of your eye, when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite! First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to help your friend with the speck in his eye. And I just want to pause and say that Jesus knew that we would be quick to judge. Jesus knew that we would have a much easier time seeing the speck in our friend's eye than the log in our own. And that's why he's addressing it. That's why James is addressing it. Scripture doesn't tell us these things to beat us up and make us feel bad about ourselves. No, can you hear the desperate plea of Jesus to change to have your eyes open to the truth and change your ways and to win the battle over your flesh. You know, maybe for some of you, you already know that this message is for you, that this is all you, that when it comes to other people, you are harsh and quick to judge. Maybe people that you know well or maybe even strangers. And if that is you, today's a really good day to say no more. I'm going to stop acting like I know more than I do. I'm going to stop creating burdens and pain for myself. And I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the breakthrough that God will do in your life today. And for others of you, maybe you'd say that you judge God. Maybe you're someone who... When a problem arises or when a prayer doesn't get answered or there's a struggle, you're quick to place false motives on God. Oh, God, why did you do this? Why did you let that happen? What did they do to deserve that? And are you trying to punish me for something that I did 10 years ago? And we put this false motive on God. And if that is you, you have to know that God's motive is only always motivated from his love. There is no evil in our God. He is always only love. He is always only good. People, yeah, we're guilty of evil motives, but that is never the case with God, ever. John 16, Jesus, he was preparing his disciples for difficulty, and he said, I told you these things so that in me you may have peace. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. And it's in the perfect peace and love of Jesus where we find hope, where we find comfort, where we find life. But in this world, there will be trouble. In this world, Jesus said it, you will have trouble. You will be disappointed, and people are going to hurt you and say mean things about you and betray you, and there's going to be tragedy that happens, and there's going to be natural disasters, and there's going to be car accidents, and bad things are going to happen in this life. And if we get into judgment, if we live from a place of judgment towards other people or towards God, we just add pain onto pain, onto pain. We pollute our minds with hate. We weigh ourselves down with anxious thoughts. We are filled with hatred and guided by our evil motives. And we just live from a place of hurt and damage. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to live like that. I don't want to live that way. So my hand is raised saying, God, change me. Teach me. Because I don't want to live that way. So what do we do? How do we practically change? I want to give us three things quickly from God's word that we can do to combat judgment and favoritism and the pain that it causes us. And the first thing, number one, if you're taking notes, is value people. Philippians 2, 3 says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, 
value others above yourself. And judgment is really the opposite of humility. Because as soon as you judge someone, you raise yourself above them. You kind of make yourself the authority on the subject of the, with the pain they caused and why they did what they did and why they said what they did. And that is not humility. But if you think about it, it doesn't take a lot of humility to treat someone well or to value someone when they have something to offer you. When we show favoritism, it's usually guided by this desire to receive something from the person you're favoring. Maybe it's attention. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's relationship. But when someone is in a position to give you something you want, you manage to treat them pretty well. But when there's nothing to be gained from a person, how much do you really value them? Remember, James says that our judgments are guided by evil motives. So we may not like to admit it, but we kind of have a tendency to devalue and judge people when the return doesn't feel very high for us. We can do this to people we barely know. We do this to strangers. We do this in situations with our family and with people closest to us, married people. You don't have to be married for very long to know that you don't know why your spouse does and says all of the things that they do and say, yeah? But when you assume to know why, when you heap judgment on their motives, that is a great way to devalue them and to cause bitterness and pain to flourish inside of you. And to hurt you. But if you want to know how to value people, like really, really value people, in every situation, in every relationship, here's the key. You have to look at people, not in the context of what they can do for you, not in the context of their worth to you, but their worth to God. Because God looked at them and said, You're worth it. I love you. I die for you. As the father was knitting us together in our mother's womb, he placed value on our lives. He calls us wonderfully, beautifully made masterpieces. And the reality is we all have the same value to God. That means the murderer the thief, the star athlete, the town gossip, the billionaire, the janitor, your very favorite aunt. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Romans 5.8 says God demonstrates his own love for this, for us in this, that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We were sinners, me and you. Failure is not worth it, but God in his love spoke value to us. He calls you valued. He calls the people you judge and overlook valued and love. And if you really want to value people, you'll start seeing them the way that God sees them. And the second thing that you can do to fight against judgment is accept people. Romans 15, 7 says, accept one another then just as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And acceptance is really simple. Acceptance basically says, I'm just going to accept you. You don't have to dress the way that I think you should dress. I don't have to like the way you talk. I don't have to like what you do. I don't have to agree with you. But I'm just going to show you value. I'm going to accept you, and I'm going to treat you with dignity just the way you are, period. That's what Jesus does. And, you know, sometimes we think that we have to, like, check off this whole list of things we have to do and and get right and change before we could be accepted, before God could value or love us. But that's not what we see in Scripture. Jesus loved and he valued every single person that he came in contact with. 
Jesus, he had this incredible ability to make sinners feel comfortable while calling them out of their sin. Now, acceptance doesn't mean approval, okay? Christians get really weird about acceptance because we think that accepting people means we have to agree with what they did or we think that their sin's okay or we have to put our stamp of approval on their lifestyle. And that's just not, that's not it. That's not, that's not what we're talking about. Loving people does not mean you approve of their sin. And approving of people's lives is just not our job. That's not our place. Jesus set the example for us to follow by his kindness, by his love, by his genuine care for people. Jesus was kind to everybody. He accepted everybody. And do you know that it's through that kindness that he led people to repentance? That's what Romans 2.4 says. said that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. And accepting people has nothing to do with you. And maybe that's the freedom somebody needs to hear today. Accepting people is not about you. It's not about what you would do or what you wouldn't do or what you think is right. It's about what God would do. And, you know, when we live through that freedom, we can just accept the people we work with. We're free to accept the people that live in our homes and the people that we meet on the street. And we can just treat people with kindness. And we can extend dignity and love to people. And we can demonstrate love like Jesus did. And it's through that kindness that you may have the influence to lead them to Jesus. The final thing is probably the most difficult. But number three, if you're taking notes, is forgive people. Until you forgive people, you will continue to judge them. And the more that you continue to judge people, the more that you grow in your bitterness towards them and your resentment towards them, the harsher the judgments become, and the more pain you're burying yourself in. Remember, you're not just causing pain on them. You're causing pain to yourself. And listen, you will not heal from the pain of your judgments until you extend forgiveness. Forgiveness is just as healing for you as it is for the person that you're forgiving. And you will not heal from the pain of your judgments until you extend forgiveness. So what's that look like practically? Pastor Jeremiah, he shared this verse last week, and the, the same principle applies. Judgments and anger and bitterness and all these things are woven together. Here's what Ephesians 4.31 says. First of all, we have some things to get rid of. Paul says, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, harsh words, and slander, as well as all types of evil behavior. Insert judgment. Insert favoritism. Instead, verse 32, he says, instead, be kind to each other, tenderhearted, forgiving, there it is, forgiving one another, just as God, through Christ, has forgiven you. And sometimes we can be really hesitant to forgive because we think it means that we're giving that person our trust back. But that's not necessarily what it means. Forgiveness isn't the restoration of trust. It's not telling somebody that what they did or what they said was right or okay. Forgiveness is releasing you And them from the weight of judgment. Listen, you don't have to hold anybody's feet to the fire and make sure they get burned and make sure that they pay for it. That's not your, that's way, that's way higher than any of our pay grades, okay? Jesus says, vengeance is mine. That's, that's not on us. Hebrews 4.13 says, everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Everything, everything is laid bare before the Father's eyes. 
but you won't have to give an account for the pain that someone else caused you. You won't be giving an account for somebody else's sin or wrongdoing. They will. Their sin will be laid bare before the Father and they'll give an account. You will give an account for your sin. You will stand before the Father and give an account for your judgment, for your anger, for your bitterness, for the hatred. And so your role is to extend forgiveness, is to free yourself and the other person from the pain of judgment, from the weight of judgment. And when you do, I tell you, you'll live lighter. You'll release that unnecessary burden of pain. And here's what I love about forgiveness. Forgiveness comes straight from the heart of our Father. I could never be good enough to forgive people on my own. But Jesus, he set the ultimate example for us. While he's hanging on the cross, he's being tortured, he's being killed. Do you remember what he did? Do you remember what he prayed to his father? He prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Jesus prayed for the people that were killing him. He forgave the people who were killing him while they were doing it. Talk about the ultimate example of forgiveness and love. And that's far better than we could ever muster up in our own hearts and in our own feelings. Forgiveness is from the heart of the Father. Doesn't matter how we feel. And as we close today, I just want you to imagine for a moment what God could do in your life if you really took a stand against judgment. Like if you really said, I'm not living like that. Anger doesn't have a place in my heart. Bitterness doesn't have unforgiveness, judgments, harsh judgments, favoritism. I'm not doing that. Like can you just imagine for a moment how your life would look if your focus in every situation, in every pain, in every trial, would just be to love people, would just be to value people, to accept people, to extend forgiveness to them. And Father, I thank you right now that your spirit is at work. Thank you that you are speaking to your people through the power of your word. God, I pray that today would be a day of breakthrough. Breakthrough for people who are willing to say, I'm not going to live from a bitter place of judgment anymore. I'm willing to work hard. I'm willing to trust Jesus to overcome this in my life. God, we give it to you today. If, that's, if you are in a place where you know that judgment is your go-to, whether it's to God or to other people, right now in your own heart and your own words, could you just call out to the Father and say, God, forgive me. I don't want to live this way. Jesus, would you help me? God, I, I, I want to listen to your word. I'm thankful for, the, for your word that convicts me. God, would you change me? Would you help me to value people and see people like you see them? Father, would you help me to accept people even if I don't agree with them? God, with this house, with, these, with this church, would we be known for loving people who are near and far from God? God, would this be a place where people come because the Christians were so nice, because the Christians were so accepting and extending so much value and worth to people, even before they felt like they deserved it. Thank you, Jesus. Would our heart be your heart, Father? For some of you, you know, maybe Maybe Jesus is revealing something to you 
that maybe you've never known before or maybe you've never really wanted to accept before. And that's the truth that Jesus values you. That Jesus accepts you just the way you are. Every failure, every mistake, every sin, every fault. He loves you and he values you. And I want you to know today that Jesus went to the cross to forgive you and make a way for you to have a relationship with him. To forgive you of those faults and those mistakes and those things that maybe you believe keep you far from God. And if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus, but you know that you need one and you know that you want one and you're ready to accept his forgiveness, his love, his grace into your life, maybe for the first time, maybe you're coming back to him in this moment, I want to invite you just to begin to pray out to the Father. Say, Jesus, I need you. Father, thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for valuing me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. God, today I give you my life. Today I choose to follow you. God, would you help me to live for you? Would you help me to grow in my love for you? Help me to want to know more about you. God, today by faith, I'm, I'm just taking the next step. I'm taking the first step. Saying, Jesus, I accept, your, I accept your forgiveness. I accept your grace. I accept your mercy. I thank you for loving me. Thank you for valuing me. Thank you for dying for me. God, today I, I, I choose to live my life for you. Thank you, Jesus. Father, thank you for meeting us here. We love you so much. In your precious name, amen.